This documentary contains actual images of spirits in their many forms, exactly as they appeared to our cameras. Absolutely no computer-generated images or post-production effects or recreations have been utilized in this production. World fantasy and Bram Stoker award-winning author P.D. Kasich was drawn to New Hope to write her forthcoming novel, New Hope. There are some places in this role, I think, that call to you. You don't know why, but they feel familiar. They feel like home. You've never been there, but it's almost a familiarity, a contact. I felt that in New Hope. I was walking across the street from the Perry Mansion. I froze in the middle of the street because I got inspired. An entire novel came to me in the space of a second. I had plot, character, setting, some dialogue. I had heard voices doing the dialogue. And my friend, you know, literally dragged me across the street and wondered what had happened. And I said, I have to come back and write this novel. At the time, it was a ghost story. At the time, I did not understand or realize that uh, New Hope is the most haunted township in the Delaware. And that ghosts are not so much the terrifying entities we believe, but in this particular town, they're neighbors. They're, you know, part and parcel of what New Hope is. You come here and you feel it immediately. There's not anything you can put your finger on, but um, I don't know, maybe you hear whispers or echoes. And it's not the scary, you know, terrifying ghost stories. It's the fact that there's something here, that there's something that will be here and remains. And it's nice. It, it gives you a feeling of comfort to know that, well, maybe there is something beyond. New Hope, Pennsylvania has everything a ghost would want as far as a haunted place. I, I think because of its history as a, as a crossroads of commerce, the railroads, the canals, the river, the roads, the highways. Um, there's always been this crossroads of human activity. And as the town developed, it, it became uh, a place, a crossroads of human drama and life and death. And because of that, the intensity of the energies there, also, of course, the nearby activity during uh, the Revolutionary War, the intensity of that energy has... Uh, made it able for a lot of ghosts, a lot of spirit energy, to remain indelible in New Hope. The, the spirits just won't leave. They like it there. Um, it has become the most haunted place in Pennsylvania, if not the United States, if not the world, because of that intensity, that indelibility of the ghosts there. Local merchant, Bob Gerenser. One of the intriguing things I think you'll find when you uh, look around the area is that whenever there's a first-hand story of something peculiar that is happening that may clearly have uh, spirits behind them, is that uh, we tend to take it in stride. Uh, most of our spirits are generally very well behaved and uh, usually they're a call for help from their past, whatever circumstance they may have found themselves in upon their demise. And the people in town either uh, welcome them as just that unusual guest or try and find help for them. And that has happened with uh, many a seance and uh, many a psychic coming through here to uh, help them on. Now if we go, we could go down here, down into the Adele Gamble has led New Hope Ghost Tours for the past 20 years. Last season, over 3,500 people joined her on her lantern-lit walks. I met uh, Adi Kent Thomas Jeffrey, who designed Ghost Tours, on her premiere tour in 1982. And I promised her that I would keep Ghost Tours 
as it was in the beginning, and that's how it is now. I had looked into the door there, and I thought I saw a shadow of something or someone. And one of my tour guides, she was with me, and I said, uh, oh, take a look inside. Do you see anything? And she said, Adele, there's a shadow. There's something that's in there. And we could see like a shadow, like walking back and forth. But it wasn't solid like you and I are solid. It was just that, a shadow moving like from there, like down into here. I was doing a tour one evening, and it was in November, and it was, it was quite cold. And Joseph Pickett decided to follow me on my tour, and I didn't realize it. He's a tall gentleman, and he has salt and pepper color hair and a handlebar mustache. Well, I was in this one area, and I was really telling my ghost story, and standing in front of me, of course, were the people. And there were two women were pointing to me to look behind me. Well, I wouldn't look behind me. Normally, I would, but I didn't. I was engrossed with the story. And when I was done with the story, they ran up to me and they said, Adele, why didn't you turn around? And I said, well, why? They said, we wanted you to see the man standing behind you. I said, a man? And I said, what did he look like? And they described a tall man, a handlebar mustache, black pants, suspenders, and a white shirt. Well, immediately I knew that was Joseph Pickett. And I said, oh, really? And they said, we thought it was really odd he didn't have a coat on because it's so cold. Well, I turned to the left and I said to the fellas, did you see anyone standing behind me? And they said, oh, sure, Adele. You thought you were going to scare us by having this man come out, but you didn't scare us. And I just kind of smiled and I said, well, guess what? You just encountered Joseph Pickett, our local ghost. It just started to move very slowly. Then I saw something go by me real quick. So I turned around and I looked and the door closed and then it opened again. And the girl that was studying to be a tour guide put her head in. She goes, I can't do this, Adele. She says, because if I would see anything or anything would materialize, I would leave the group. The owner was there uh, one night very, very late with a few friends and all the lights, they weren't all on. Just just near where they were sitting. And all of a sudden the lights went completely out. And he thought, oh, don't tell me we blew a fuse. But he went over to the switch and he thought, well, let me try it. It was like a dimmer switch. Something or someone got the dimmer switch and just turned it all the way down so the lights would go off. Over here is the Joseph Pickett house. And we did a seance back there, believe it or not, 19 years ago. I guess I wasn't paying enough attention for Joseph Pickett because as I was sitting there, I felt something or someone reach over and grab my hair and my head was yanked back like that and I screamed, help me, Adi, something or someone has me. And that was my introduction into ghost tours and I'm still here. <laughs> People often say to me, Adele, aren't you afraid? And I tell them, not really, because I... I feel that spirit would never hurt me. I'm very comfortable with what I do, and I'm very comfortable with the ghost, because I always tell everyone, you don't have to worry about my ghost, because they're like Casper, they're very friendly. I've had a lot of different encounters, and I'm very, very at ease with this. It's, I think that people get frightened because of the unknown, and it's basically energy that we're picking up. It seems that every theater worth its salt has a ghost. They call it the, the poltergeist thief ghost, uh, sort of jokingly, but it, it's not a joke when, when things start to disappear. When things disappear, they can't be found for days, and then they reappear in the weirdest of places. It's not a joke if you're trying to put on a show to mount a show or, uh, or some sort of program, and this ghost keeps turning lights out or opening doors as you're trying to be, you know, in the middle of a mood, you're setting a mood for a show or rehearsing, all of a sudden, oh, a door opens or oh, a light goes off or on. So it's a, it's a playful, uh, poltergeistic kind of ghost at that theater. I'd like to welcome you to uh, the second floor of a building my family owns here in the middle of uh, New Hope. Uh, we're standing in what is uh, used by the Bucks County Academy of Fencing which I think is highly uh, appropriate art and science to be taught in this modern day and age, considering the number of people in the area that may have been dispatched by a duel. Uh, the building, the original foundation, goes back to pre-revolutionary war times, 
and the outlaws that I may have mentioned earlier, the Doan brothers, actually had family that owned this section of the building. I mentioned that I'm a man of science, but on the first night when we were working here and exploring various passages in the building, the building was locked, and while we were working in the basement, we clearly heard five footsteps pounding overhead. We dashed up the stairs. Mark went out on the sidewalk. I went through the building. There was no one in the dark on the sidewalk in either direction, and there surely was no one in the building. We turned it inside and out, discovered no one. By different counts of who does what here, by who I'm talking to our uh, permanent guests that uh, may have departed this mortal coil a long time ago, there seems to be at least three different entities that are in this building. One we call the light-eating ghost, the other we call the tripping ghost, and the third is the electronic ghost. Uh, anytime we're doing work on a ladder or we're climbing up high, I have, I know, been pushed off of ladders and off of stools. I have often felt a firm grip around my ankles pulling me down. The fencers that do competition here, uh, they love to use that as their favorite excuse. Fencers are normally very graceful and very sure-footed when they're applying their trade, yet they have been knocked off balance pushed over, and downright, they know that that touch should have made it, but it didn't. Uh, of all the stories I've told you, and uh, I've experienced these things, I, I remain skeptical, only because uh, I, I've never made either that leap of faith or final connection to uh, the supernatural, the other world, whatever these things are. I know events happen. This event is so crystal clear a function of something that I can't explain in any rational fashion that I think it really does have to be supernatural. When we do our colonial Christmas ball, we have some 200 candles lit here. We have uh, candles on the wall in wall sconces, table candles in uh, candle chimneys. We have a number of chandeliers throughout the room. And it's really quite magical, beautiful glow, and this is how the room was lit at the turn of the uh, last century. We've learned, being colonial reenactors, how important fire is and how danger it can, dangerous it can be. So at the end of our event, uh, the core group stands by as all of the candles are extinguished. We wait here 15 minutes in the dark to be certain that nothing is burning. If there was a uh, ember stuck on one of the candle wicks, we'd spot it once our lights are used to the dark and everybody's assigned a section of the room. On this uh, one particular Christmas ball, we'd stood fire watch and ended the evening. There was no access to the property overnight. I came in with the cleanup crew the next morning and the chandelier on the stage was burning. If it had been going through the night, the candles would have melted and extinguished themselves. I have no explanation for it. No one was in here. No one could have gotten in here. We know that the lights were out. The candles were extinguished. It was burning when we got here. The building has over a 200 year history. Uh, the town has an incredible history. All we do is uh, just look and laugh and marvel whenever we meet these uh, presences because they don't really seem to be out to get us. They just want to be remembered every once in a while. interesting ghost at Pineapple Hill. Uh, they call it the kissing ghost and if you can just imagine at some point you're you're in bed at uh, Pineapple Hill and you feel someone's hovering over your your bed and you look up indeed there is a spirit hovering over you. 
and uh, you feel that there's something brushed up against your cheek, and indeed you've been kissed by that spirit. Some believe the spirit is that of John Scott, who's the former owner of that property. In this room, you often hear someone walking up the back stairs, and it's gotten to the point where I've been in the room either painting or repairing something, and I'm so sure my husband is behind me that I'll just be talking away, and I'm the talker in the family. So I'll be talking for 10, 15 minutes, and then I'll realize he hasn't made any sound, <laughs> and I'll turn around and realize no one else is in the room. And what'll happen is people will be in this room, and they'll be kind of in between that when you wake up state when you're just starting to wake up in the morning and they'll hear someone walk up and then they'll feel someone lean over and kiss them and then they'll wake all the way up. Most of the activity um, that's unusual is located in this room that we're in now and in the room above and they're the two oldest parts of the house. This room and the sitting room attached to it, the adjoining room, were built in 1780 and then the rest was in the 1830s of the edition. In preparing for this interview, I read all of the room diaries again, and there was a great story up in the room above where a man said that he heard a creaking, kind of a creaking noise, and he walked into his sitting room and he said, okay, if you're in there, knock it off, and he came back to bed, and it stopped for a little while, and then it started again and he walked back in again and the same thing repeated. And then third time he said, okay, I really need my sleep, please stop for the night. And he went back to bed and it stopped. And in the morning he was walking around trying to figure out what it could be and he spun the spinning wheel that's in there. And that was the noise that he had been hearing. Spirit investigator and sensitive Kathy Curtis and photographer Rick Fulton have come to Pineapple Hill to communicate with and photograph the spirits. They've taken thousands of photographs and conducted hundreds of investigations of spirit activity across the United States, including all the major Civil War battlefields. Come on, John. Can we go up? Coming up, John, don't run away. Scott? Okay, that's a flirt. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, no, I, 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 I like to go down totally black cellars, actually. I can see them better. You have a number here. No, I went down that way. Before. There's a good, you have a lot of nice people like here. Trish Lawler, John and the people that are staying here, they're aware of it? What's in here? Upstairs. Oh, okay. My favorite places are the cellars and the attics. Mm -hmm. This is like a crawl space in here? Yeah. Well, actually, there's a couple little kids that I think used to play in here. I just want to see if anybody was in here. We used to play in our crawl space too, actually. Mm-hmm. Would you oblige us with your photograph? Your image? He doesn't know what a photograph is. Oh, how old are you? Seven. Okay, don't play with the camera, okay? Love you. Let go over and touch him. I'll be careful. I think that you'll be have the little boy will come downstairs eventually. Really? Yeah, and children I think are a lot lot easier uh, and a lot more apt to be seen. But his name's Stephen. S T E P H A N. Oh my God, that was a nice. It's tonal vibrations over here. That's your Oh, I'm getting used to him. I feel like I have a monkey on my back. <laughs> you do. <laughs> Sorry, uh, no, he's a nice monkey. It's okay. Oh. 
Isn't John beautiful? You might have heard the term orb. Mm -hmm. People say orbs. They're not orbs at all. When the soul departs from the body, it's a mass of, of pure spirit energy. And uh, even spirits themselves uh, prefer basic soul form because that's essentially what, what it is. But uh, I, I know I myself, I don't want to be called an orb, especially if I'm not even around, you know. <laughs> you have quite a few. The black bass seems to uh, sort of encompass everything that's good about Bucks County and New Hope. Um, it's a scenic place, of course, but there are ghosts at the black bass, and very interesting ghosts. And they, they range from the, the lantern room downstairs all the way up into the second floor where several of the bed chambers are haunted. One in particular haunted by the spirit of a uh, la rather large woman, kind of bawdy woman, who is said to carry a pearl-handled pistol. Now, that's not the kind of ghost you'd want to see if you're staying there. But, as it turns out, she's uh, just kind of patrolling the place. I guess uh, most activity that, uh, that, we, that we do have in a hotel is in the hotel area itself. Um, and right in the Grover Cleveland room, outside that room, as well as in uh, the bar that we're in right now. Uh, but the Grover Cleveland room, uh, that's where uh, apparitions were noticed uh, before in the past, as well as uh, some of the staff noticed uh, cold spots in the hallway, uh, as if they were just walking and they just go through a, a small segment of just uh, real chilly air. At one point, it was about 10 years ago, we had a family that stayed here. Uh, we had two rooms that are adjoining in the hotel. And uh, there was uh, two children staying in one room, and in the other room was the parents. And they were staying here for the evening. They, they arrived about 5 o'clock. They had, uh, had dinner. They went up to uh, bed down for the evening. And about uh, 45 minutes later, the whole family came rushing down the stairs in a, in a semi-panic and came in and asked the hostess at the time uh, if there was any place else that they could stay. And uh, at the time, we didn't have any other rooms. We were booked. So the hostess was uh, curious as to what the problem was, and they said that, uh, the door adjoining the two rooms, they, uh, they saw uh, uh, some sort of uh, apparition come through the door and basically happened at the same time where the children saw it and the parents saw it uh, simultaneously in both the rooms. So when this was happening, they were uh, uh, immediately out into the hallway and where they found out that uh, neither, neither the groups, neither the children nor the parents was actually uh, making this happen. So. They went up staying downstairs in, uh, in our lobby. We had to put them, up, uh, put them up that night in the lobby on the floor. Oh. This is, yeah, this is really, um, this is a really nice warm place. I imagine people really, you get a lot of compliments, you know, when they leave, or probably when they're still here. This is a really happy place. I mean, it's strange because I know that, hmm, I was going to say I know, I know that there were a number of men who were killed here in a lot of brawls downstairs, tavern fights and all that, but they didn't fight with their fists. I mean, they had the daggers and all of that. Yeah, that's how Hans was. Yeah, but... Um, I think that there might have been a woman killed here, at least one woman killed here. Kind of like a um, Ma Flanders kind of personality. Yeah. I think it was accidental. I don't think any, you know, I just got that flash. So, I mean, I, again, I don't know if I'll see this woman while we're here till what, 10, 10 o'clock? Or um, if one of the other spirits just gave me that image. Richard, come here. Right in the corner. It's not anything shameful because spirits were like us. And it's just one difference. 
the form. They have shed their the mortal form. And we're still encumbered with it. <laughs> Mr. Boyce, I can get sometimes. But uh, it's the only difference. And of course, once they've been into the light and if they return, they are filtered of uh, negative earthly traits like greed, um, anger. It's not to say a spirit can't get upset, but they, they um, once they've been into the light, uh, as they put it themselves, they've been filtered, purified of the, what they call the vicious emotions. You know, emotions that could hurt someone or cause someone harm or, or stress. It's some kind of, any kind of pain, you know, whether it's emotional or physical. There's a guy, see if he's around. He's, I can smell him. I know that sounds funny. He's got like uh, velvet and he's being really shy. That Hans. Well, let me see. How about if I stand? Well, I don't know. You've got the glass there. Um, okay, i tell you what. Look, how's this? I'll stand here. This is all solid wood. Come on, Hans. <laughs> You rascal. <laughs> yes. He's wearing some kind of velvet that's wet or sweaty. <laughs> Has an odor. You see him? Yep, got him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, figures. Okay, Hans, let's go. Come upstairs. Huh? Okay. I need your glasses, though. I can't see. <laughs> oh, isn't he precious? He's so, see, you can see how shy he is. You can feel it when you look at them, you know? A lot of people think that if you have money and you have a nice home and everything's paid for, that you should be happy. Not true. Not true. In fact, even I know people that have everything, but they don't believe in much at all. I've actually uh, said to people, how can you be happy with just two cars, fancy house, um, lots of friends, lots of, all of the material things, but you, you're missing a lot. And I'll say, what do you think you're missing? And they'll say, well, okay, I come home to an empty house, and I cry a lot. You know, you catch them off guard, and they'll own up to the truth. But um, I don't try to convert anybody. I just say, hey, there's so much more in the world, you know? I, I just can't picture life without spirits, because they've always been there. They've always been there. At the mansion, of course, it's an old house and it settles and it pops and there's noises from outside. I personally have heard sounds that might or might not have been from outside or settling building, but I, I thought possibly they weren't. I have definitely heard ch children's footsteps once. Uh, objects have been moved and I haven't known who would have moved them because I would be the only person here for a given period of time. I have never been frightened in the house. I, at time to time, sort of been more alert than others, particularly at night on the occasions that I've had to be here at night. But the mansion is not frightening. Uh, the spirits, if 
my feeling always was if, prior to Kathy, if there were spirits here, that they were friendly or at least not hostile and, and benevolent. The house does not give off an unfriendly feeling. I'm not sure I had preconceived feelings about the spirit world, but Kathy's approach was very much as uh, a warm human being asking something of a shy child to appear, and it was a very normal sort of approach, a normal approach to things that you can't see, and as such didn't make me feel as, as though it were phony or contrived or anything else. It was someone requesting the presence of someone else. Put your cheek in, in. Okay. Close your eyes and just take a couple deep breaths. And then open your eyes real slowly and you'll get a rise. It'll be almost like a, like a... They're getting high on not, the shellac now. No. <laughs> what you're doing is you're tapping into the tonal vibrations of the ear. I hear things. Mm-hmm. You hear... Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I love it already. Where are you going? There's more What's off. going on? Look it, at this. Does it ever stop? It's a head thing. Oh, it's beautiful. What did you see? That's a big rat in there. Oh. oh, don't say that. <laughs> I'm afraid of rats. I'm not afraid of rats. What's your head? Oh, it's copy webs, too. That's all right. That is Oliver with Father Richard, just before Richard died at age 92, which would make it about 1928. But doesn't he look 92? Yeah. Father and grandfather Perry, Richard, and Oliver Randolph. Well, taken about 1932, has to be around 28. Jane Paxson Perry Mall MacGyver Little. Very pretty woman. I'm going down in the cellar and see if anyone will talk to me. Okay. <laughs> my friends. Oh my, yeah. Really? Oh look. Okay. That one's very bright and chipper, Let's isn't it? I'm sucking my battery down too. Oh yeah. Oh they were oh they're all over her. They're oh look out, Kathy. Mm -hmm. Kathy, do you feel little hands going all uh -huh, over your body? Uh -huh, hey. uh -huh. Because you've got them everywhere. Look at that. They're all over. I'm trying to figure out why she's so bored. Look at this, yeah. Kathy uh, made the spirit world visible. Uh, I hadn't really accepted or not accepted the existence. I needed the proof of my eyes. And when Kathy came to the mansion and the spirits appeared on the camera, then I felt that I had to believe. Without question, uh, the most haunted place in New Hope, being one of the most haunted places in America, is the Logan Inn. And still it remains a charming place. It's not some hell hole where ghosts swirl around and threaten you. Actually, it's very uh, docile spirits there. Uh, room six appears to be the most, uh, the most haunted of all the rooms within that haunted inn. Uh, simple things, uh, you hear a baby crying perhaps, uh, a soft moaning sound. Maybe you'll see a, a shadowy form glide through the room. The door may open and slam shut. Um, other things like that would happen that are disturbing, 
but not uh, evil or foreboding in any way. Also in the basement of the Logan Inn, uh, reported the uh, ghost of a, of a Hessian soldier. And some reports, other reports a Continental soldier. So we really don't know who's haunting the basement, but the spirit activity is quite high at the Logan Inn. Room six at the Logan Inn has been thought to be haunted and being the innkeeper there for over 12 years, I've heard many stories of people who've slept in the room. When people ask if the inn is haunted, we said, well, it's thought to be, but we never confirm that it is haunted. As many times it will just scare people away. But room six has an extraordinary history and amount of happenings there that you can't really explain why things have happened there. The most unusual that I've found going into the room, it's the coldest room in the house, which it shouldn't be being located on the second floor with southern exposure. If anything, it would be on the third floor. But uh, in this case, it's a sunny room with three windows. There's just no explaining the amount of occurrences that have happened there. Another area that has thought to be haunted, and many of us have, don't even want to go down to the basement because of it, um, you have just very unusual feelings. It just really feels as though someone's going to jump out behind those stone walls. Because during the Revolutionary War, they stored the bodies under our present kitchen, and some were cremated, and it's thought that one of the soldiers who wasn't dead was cremated. Therefore, there have been uh, sightings of this Revolutionary soldier stalking our hallways. One thing that's very peculiar, at the head of the stairs is a portrait of uh, Carl's grandparents. And different people have taken photographs of that portrait. When you take photographs of it, different images have appeared. The most recent that was sent to us was of a skeletal head to the left of the gentleman in the portrait. One time I had in guests stay in room six and they wanted to see if they could stay there with their daughter because she'd gone on the ghost tours and since she was 14. They took photographs, showed them to me, and I didn't notice anything in particular other than the fact they'd used a Polaroid uh, with a flash, other than that it looked as though there were sort of a halo around their heads. But then about two or three months later, they came back with the same photographs and there between the husband and wife was a distinct silhouette of a man with long white hair and a long white cloak stepping right out between them, right out of the portrait. But that was really extreme. After I checked people out, one of the housekeepers came to me, Tricia, and she always called me mom, said, Mom, what do you suppose is wrong or what happened in room six? I said, frankly, I don't know because they didn't check out with me. They left and I don't know at what point in time. As I came on at eight to make breakfast, the key was there and they left. She said, well, something's very peculiar because all her sheets were in the shower stall soaking wet. And I said, well, that's odd. About a week later, I had this call from this person. He said he was the in-guest there with his friend, his companion, and in the middle of the night he had this horrible, horrible dream, and he felt someone was strangling him. And it was so weird, and the person who he was with, she had a similar experience, and he proceeded to wet the bed. And they were so upset that they wouldn't stay. They left about two or three o'clock in the morning. And they very kindly, thoughtfully, put all the sheets in the shower stall and wetted them down for me. But then they wanted to come back as, and stay in the room again and wondered if I would issue them a gift certificate so that they could come for another night for no charge. I said, I don't think so. Wow, look 
Could you see him? Did you have the camera up there? Wow. Well, I can show you the, uh, the, 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 uh, I'm so excited. What, what am I trying to say? The discs. You'll see, Jimmy. letting us smell decaying bodies, burned bodies. That's not nice. We don't, we want pleasantry today, okay? That was 200 years ago. How about a nice floral scent? Love you, love you, love you. Come on, you. Come on. Come on, my friend. No, don't be... Come away from that silver heater, whatever it is. Mortar heater. Come on, come with us. Come on, we're gonna go all through the house. Come on. They did a wonderful job on your painting. I bet you're so happy. I'm gonna go upstairs and visit with you in a little bit too. Cause I feel silly talking to a portrait. <laughs> okay, I need you all have to help me with this camera, okay? Because I got a problem with with the clicker thing. Okay? Remember I told you you had one above you? See? Say that the ones downstairs will get upset. Hello. It's just so hard to tell. Oh, Emily, why can't you be your bright usual self? Of all days when the camera's not working. One more time, Emily. Love you. Love you. I'll just click. Oh, I broke a nail. I'm just gonna click, okay? Boom, boom, boom. Right there, right there, don't move. Right on the bed. I invited every, pretty much every spirit who was ever born, raised, and crossed over in New Hope to join us in room six at the Logan for a party that evening. And then I, it was about five of three, and they started to Streams through the windows, through the furniture, through the walls, the ceiling, the floor. <laughs> they arrived from everywhere. The video speaks louder than words. This one particular night, I think it was early July, Emily was seen coming down the stairs, literally in a, a fashion that's, again, hard, hard to find words to describe. I have always loved that look, and then it is such, such a beautiful place to see beautiful spirits. I do not call the Logan Inn haunted, I call it highly spirit active with many beautiful, positively loving and warm people. There are two reported ghosts at the Van Zandt Bridge. Uh, one seems to be the ghost of a repentant woman who allegedly murdered her child by throwing her off the bridge. Uh, 
The other uh, unidentified man whose moaning spirit can be heard clunking through that bridge. Uh, the bridge is one of the most uh, reportedly haunted places in the area, and it dates back to about 1869 when the first recorded ghost story uh, came out of that, uh, that bridge. It also, though, because of the accessibility and, it's, and, it's, uh, and it's the legends that precede it, it's spawned a lot of what I call urban legends that uh, may or may not be believable but it still remains haunted and fascinating. Come on, everybody. Come on. Now I'm gonna bring some out, okay? Come on, friends. Come on. I love you. Love you. Who is that? Who is that? Who is that? Aren't you something? Did you see his blue sparks? That's the colonel. Come on, join the others. Come on, we love you. We love you so much. That's right, come on. Come on. See them in the grass? Rich? Wow. Okay, everybody, we still have some time left. You know why we're here. Now, the Colonel. There you are. Hello. That's okay, he's not here yet. He's still got a good ways to go. He's telling me that there's a unit, <laughs> meaning the car. It's okay. It's okay. We love you, that's right. They're right in front of your camera. Look, and I don't mean the bugs, okay? Can you imagine the looks on everybody's faces? When they see you, how beautiful you all are. Yep. You know, you don't have to stay here. You're not confined here. We love you so much. We thank you for sharing your beauty and your love with us and with everybody who will see you. And we'll be back. We will be back to visit. Spirits that return here all have a distinct purpose, and uh, that's the purest essence of us, the, uh, our soul, pure love, pure universal love, pure spirit energy. We are created in the image of God. God is in spirit. This which covers us is just a mortal cloak. It's not the real us. No one should be judged how they look, how they speak, what they do in life. It's their soul, their spirit. That's our pure essence. This one spirit who seemed to be quite prominent, he tended to hover by the microphone. When he did this, these sounds of tonal vibrations were emitting from him and were directly heard on the microphone. I could see where there were a number of spirits in their various forms present throughout the whole two, two and a half hour duration. I think we were there. They were leaping down from from their dimension, um, over fences, waltzing along behind all of us. It was a clear evening and absolutely no kind of fog or mist whatsoever. Richard, they're right behind.
here. I love you. I love you. Come in. Come in. Come on in. I almost cried again, but it was a happy cry.